We've faced trials and tribulations to make it past Act 1 and Act 2 on the hardest difficulty. But now Soft, our lone wolf solo fighter, faces her deadliest challenges yet in Act 3. Can she make it to the end while facing the toughest fights in the game? Well, she can certainly try. If you haven't checked out the first two videos, I'd highly recommend doing so over here, for both context on the build and the self-imposed rules. But with that out of the way, let's get into the run. We set upon the road to Baldur's Gate after leaving the Shadow Cursed Lands, and it's a long one. As such, before we can arrive at the city proper, we find ourselves camping in some old ruins just outside the main road. Our rest, however, is disturbed by some Gith Yankee suddenly appearing in an attempt to steal our artifact that's been keeping us mostly sane, and a fight breaks out. All the while, we hear the voice of our dream visitor asking for help. The Gith jumped through a mysterious glowing portal to get to our camp and very rudely awaken Soft with some thwax and wax that deal a minimal amount of damage. Thankfully, the portal is left behind and unguarded, and naturally Soft is just way too tired to deal with whatever the heck is going on here. So we misty step out of their reach and dash into the portal. Who knows, maybe it'll take us to the city. Nope, this ain't Baldur's Gate. Instead, we stumble upon a fight between more Githyanki and friendly intellect devourers, strangely enough. The Githyanki are brutally outnumbered, though, and with the brainstorm pulling aggro, they go down decently quick. Though it does take a bit longer since I forgot to bind to the lightning jabber, which also means all our brainiacs bite the dust, right before we finish off the last enemy. We head towards this super cool space god skull and find out the Githyanki are fighting a mind flayer, who's on our side? What? And not just that, the Mind Flayer is also our dream visitor, who's been protecting us using an imprisoned, super-powered Githyanki to fend off the voice of the Absolute. Upon learning this, we decide to join the fight and get to whooping some alien booty. Our enemies got hands, however, and they destroy all our intellect devourer friends in a matter of moments, with a combination of deadly explosions and space foo. Thankfully, our newly acquainted Mind Flayer pal, or oldly acquainted, I guess, Mind controls one of them before our turn. When the turn order gets around to us, we start by using a second wind to top off our health a bit more after taking a bit of chip from these spacefaring martial artists. Then we do what we do best and start throwing, landing just one hit. Back to the enemies, a couple of them waste their turns trying to land blows on us, but one of them tosses out a frickin' fireball, which thankfully we have resistance to, and another uses the monk equivalent of hold person on us to which we fail to save. The Emperor, that's our Mind Flayer pal, by the way, saves the day with a clutch chain lightning, which breaks the concentration before we miss even a single turn. Thanks, pal. You're still a creepy catfish manipulator, though. On our turn, we use our first couple throws to take out one of the Gith, before action surging to do the same to another. After which, we use a potion of healing to make sure the rest of this fight goes down easy. With two enemies left, we're really not stressed, though. They spend their remaining turns failing miserably, and we spend our remaining turns succeeding awesomely. The Emperor also occasionally does something useful. But, either way, with a few well-placed throws, the fight is soon over. Afterwards, we find out the Emperor apparently doesn't like the way we look at him. Can't imagine why. And more importantly, we find out that the Emperor was once an adventurer like us before being turned into a Mind Flayer, and after being turned, used their powers for good. Eventually, though, the Elder Brain got a hold on him and made him a dastardly fellow before he eventually stumbled upon Prince Orpheus, the imprisoned Gith, whom he now uses as an energy source to resist the Brain, since Orpheus is just that cool. After learning all this, literally nothing changes for us, and we go back to bed. A very bloodstained bed at that. My god. The next morning we head into town on the outskirts of the city proper, and a little girl tells us her mom is dead or something. But this is a solo run, so we pay her to leave us alone. Naturally. There happens to be quite the circus going on just a little further down the road, and after negotiating passage inside, we meet a rather rude djinn, who's in charge of a Wheel of Chance style game. But here's the kicker. He uses a ring of mage hand to rig the game so we can never actually win. Thankfully, he's not too attached to the ring, so we pickpocket away from him after a few failed attempts and try the wheel again. Upon winning the jackpot, he gets just a wee bit angry and teleports us to a jungle full of dinosaurs, with a large chest and a portal out at the far end. We stealth our way through the jungle with the help of an invisibility potion, only breaking our legs a little, grab the chest, and get out of dodge. 
Once we're safe and sound, we head up to a beautiful vista and unlock the chest, finding Nirulna inside. Nirulna is a plus three trident that just does so much, but the basic gist is that it's permanently bound to us, glows with an aura of light, increases our movement speed by three meters, and that part gets applied every time you throw the weapon, negates fall damage, gives us a few extra cool moves to blast enemies around the battlefield, and most importantly, when thrown, deals 3d4 thunder damage in a 6 meter radius centered wherever it hits. We are very happy to be in Irulna's new forever home. It's worth noting that this act is huge, and we spent a lot of time exploring it, and getting up to wacky side adventures, but if I included everything in this video, it would be endless. So at some parts, I will either omit or very briefly go over our misadventures. One such misadventure was testing Nerulna. We went down to a cove by the water where we found a fight between two gangs going down and decided this would be a perfect opportunity to test the weapon. We pissed both gangs off and got to throwing, and we learned two important things from this fight. Number one, this weapon is nutty, it shreds everyone in an AoE. And number two, soft, unfortunately, is part of everyone, so we gotta be careful when throwing at close enemies. This fight went down fast though, either way. We resume our more important main progress and convince this lady we're Gortash's newest bodyguard, on our first attempt too, and then get led into his keep that guards the city proper. Before we enter the city though, we meet Gortash, who basically proposes that we work together to kill Orin and then rule the world together. We play along so he doesn't meddle with us during our time in the city and continue on. Now that we're finally in the city, we get to exploring, and we make our way to the Elf Song Tavern, which is the Emperor's old stomping grounds. He lets us know he might have some of his old loot lying around that could be of interest to us, so we decide to check it out. After killing 80 billion rats in the basement, we gain access to the secret hideout, which is currently being searched by a bunch of gith. We decide to show him what for, and get to fighting. Unfortunately, these are some very tough enemies, with all sorts of class levels, but most importantly, paladins, who we rightfully fear. To make matters worse, the geometry in this area is pure garbage, with all the pillars and railings and curtains and even open air just completely blocking our trident's throwing path. And it's very cramped, which means half the time we throw it, we'll be hitting ourselves with the AoE. And to top it off, they've got a couple mages who are summoning more gith by the moment. As the fight starts, we get smited, smoted, smitten, shot by an arrow, mind steel linked, hold person, and shortly thereafter, brutally murdered. Needless to say, we decide to come back to this one at a later date, once we're a bit more powered up. In our search for more power, we stop by Sorceress Sundries elsewhere in the city where we meet this donkey weed again, who is looking for the Night Song. And we tell him that the Night Song was an Asimar who we set free, to which he storms off and leaves behind, good lord, a mountain of experience, which is enough to bump us up to level 8. This level grants us a bit more HP, a new spell learned for which we choose Blur to make it even harder for enemies to hit us, and most importantly a third feat. And for this one, we just go with a plus two to our constitution to bump our HP up that much more in addition to making it easier to maintain concentration on our spells. We head deeper into the city and stumble across Damon, a tiefling pal from the first two acts who set up shop here. We decide a couple of his items are must-haves, but as of now we can only afford one, the Boots of Persistence. These boots grant us both freedom of movement and long strider. The former prevents our movement speed from getting reduced along with preventing the paralyzed and restrained conditions, and the latter increases our move speed by 3 meters. And as the cherry on top, we also get a plus one to our dex saves. Having gotten a couple power ups, we decide to head back to the Elf Song Tavern. We give it a couple more attempts, but we die, and we die again. So we decide to put this one on the back burner once more. We continue our meandering down to the docks, where we find Volo, who's found himself in a bit of a pickle as he's about to be lynched. And to repay him for the cool invisibility seeing eye, we decide to reverse the lynching and kill everyone who is about to do the same to him. Thankfully, the passerbys don't care, and Volo scampers off to our camp for a second time. Back at camp, we go to bed, and the Emperor tries putting the moves on soft, which is Horrifying on so many levels, so I thought you should share that mental weight with me. You're welcome. Amongst our other hijinks, we head back to Sorcerer's Sundries and break our way into the magical vaults held therein, and once inside we steal all the goodies, selling what we don't like and keeping the scrolls that might have uses for us. We then rob a mausoleum in our spare time in a search to find enough gold to sate Damon, 
And we also adopt a small child in the hopes we can force her into child labor and get infinite free soup. As the child gets to work, we head to church to see if enforced child labor is a sin or not, and while there we find out one of the priests was mysteriously killed by an underwater something or other, and they want us, being the upstanding citizen we are, to investigate. We found out this underwater something was actually a submarine used by Gortash to transfer important prisoners to and from an underwater prison called the Iron Throne. We use this submarine to go to the prison, because why the heck not? And Gortash really doesn't like this, and says we won't be besties after this. Soft naturally sees this as a huge win, and proceeds onwards. Well in the prison, the whole place starts self-destructing, and so Hwagen, fish people that is, start pouring out the wazoo. We do our best to keep them at bay while breaking out some of the prisoners to further annoy Gortash. I'm not gonna lie, I had no idea what was going on half the time here, but we saved a couple of the prisoners and made it out nice and easy with the use of a speed potion. One of the prisoners was Duke Ravenguard, an important political figure in the city, and once freed, he vows to aid us in the fight to come. Not that we need the help. Looking for more chaos to cause in the city, we find Marina, the girl we rescued from Ethel in Act 1, and her posse of adventurers who are investigating the goings-ons of a hag in the city, who they believe to be Ethel. We follow the trail, and sure enough, it leads straight to Ethel, who really sucks at pretending that she's not a hag. Quite a few fights get completely demolished by us before we actually manage to catch Ethel in her newest hideout, the most notable of them being her new and improved Whispering Mask fight. They go down quick enough though, putting up no real notable resistance, but once we're finished with them, we achieve level 9. Alongside level 9, we get another bump to our HP. I would say how much exactly, but I realize the level up screen is incorrect since it doesn't calculate the hag hair we got in Act 1. And as an extra bonus, we get the indomitable feature, which allows us to, upon failing a saving throw, re-roll the throw once per long rest. Most importantly, our proficiency bonus increases to plus 4 at this level, which translates to almost all our rolls improving. After that, we manage to finally catch up to Ethel. Since we've got protection from evil and good on us, she really can't do much to us in this fight, since her preferred method of damaging us is Ray of Sickness, which unfortunately for her requires an attack roll. The main gimmick added on to this fight compared to the first time we fought her is that this time she's got some mushrooms around the room that will heal her up each round if not destroyed first, but we pick them off super easy. Once those are dealt with, Ethel goes down soon after to just a few solid throws. Reporting back to Marina, she is overjoyed, and we get our quest reward along with the newest staple to our build in the form of the Fae Semblance Amulet. The Fae Semblance Amulet grants us advantage on intelligence, wisdom, and charisma saving throws. Simple and to the point, but goodness gracious is it a solid item, especially since we're terrible at all of those saves. Shortly after, we find another fun little dungeon to infiltrate in the form of the Sar Palace, a place that is occupied by the world's most obvious vampire. I mean, there's bats flying around constantly, the decor is spooky to say the least, and all the servants are mysteriously enthralled by their duty to their master. I mean, come on, man. We talk to one of the servants and find out that the master of the house is currently ascending, which is why no one of importance is about, and we figure that would probably be fun to stop. As we're searching for where the guy is ascending, we stumble upon a furry convention gone wrong, if the blood is anything to go by. We're heck outnumbered, but would you look at that? Hallelujah, I finally remembered elixirs exist. And we're coming out swinging with the elixir of bloodlust, which grants us 5 temp HP and an extra action the first time that we kill an enemy each turn. It's like infinite action surges, it's completely bonkers and questionably balanced. This causes this fight to be completely trivialized as we go full machine gun mode, throwing and throwing and throwing. With the added AoE from Nerulna, these guys don't stand a chance. We head to the basement from there and we find Kazador Sar, the master of the house, who seems to have some misconceptions about Soft's relationship with Astarion, who, by the way, is here at level 1 just getting the life drained out of him. Anyways, the fight breaks out and we instantly take 61 points of damage and have our concentration broken. Bad start. Very, very bad start. You see, Kazador has an interesting gimmick during this fight. He's got 7 people who he's draining life from, each one granting 10 to HP and 1d10 bonus necrotic damage on each of his attacks. Some of them, like Asterion, also grant additional effects, such as granting an extra bonus action. Basically, we gotta take out these ritual sources ASAP. On our turn, we start by tossing Nerulna at a bat to get the extra action from our elixir, since the AoE doesn't count as us delivering the kill. Once we get the extra action, we kill Astarion, 
use our bonus action to heal up with a potion, cast protection from evil and good on ourselves, and then action surge to start pelting down some of the other ritual sources. The goons all start surrounding us, though the only ones we're really worried about is the stinky ghouls who fart on us, and should we fail a save, we then lose the ability to take actions. Oh, and Chatterteeth, who just looks at us funny and puts us to sleep. Thankfully, the rest of the gang doesn't want to disturb our sleep, so they just stare at us for a little while until eventually one of the bats decides to bite us, but at this point there is such a dense wall of enemies surrounding us that only those closest can actually make attacks against us. By the time it rolls back around to us, we've lost a ton of health. So we start by using our biggest health pot again, then chucking a couple void bulbs to get the enemies as close to off the edge as possible. We use our next action to make a couple throws at Chatterteeth and break his concentration. We're completely out of spell slots at this point, so no more shield spells, which means the enemies land quite a few good hits in on us. When it gets back to us, we use one of Nerulna's special moves to shove some dudes off the edge, and then throw to finish off Chatterteeth. Also, I remember I can just pick people up and throw them off the cliff, so I do that to one dude as well. Thankfully, most of the enemies surrounding us are bats, so the rest of the enemies can't reach us, and they just kinda growl at us, even Kazador. We use the other Nerulna ability to kill all the bats around us, and our remaining action to just yeet two more ghouls off the edge. Bye bye bozos. Now that our wall of bats has run out, Kazador is back to targeting us with his mega damaging spells. On the other hand, it's pretty much just us and him left, and with the amount of potions we've got once we deal with a couple of these ritual sources, we are in the clear. Still feeling some amount of urgency, we down a potion of speed and toss a healing potion at ourselves. Then, we toss another Nerulna at Asterion, who was brought back, before finishing off the werewolf, then moving on to start poking the other sources. Kazador, seeing the tides turn against him, pulls out a call lightning, which makes things just a little bit dire. From here on out, we're basically just using our bonus action to heal up as much as we can, with the occasional throw being used for a potion as well, while trying to find time to pelt down the sources. Papa Sar, understandably, is befuddled and upset. And before our speed potion runs out, we cast Globe of Invulnerability using a scroll, which probably saves our life. After that, we take out the sources one by one by one, and Kazador is essentially helpless by the end, so it's not hard to finish him off. Oh boy, what a fight. Truly a well-earned victory. And I'm not upset at all that I found out like five minutes afterwards that I could have just tossed him off the edge. Regardless, the fight was enough to take us up to level 10, and with level 10 we get even more HP, an additional level 2 spell slot, the Elder Strike feature which gives enemies disadvantage against our next spell we cast on them after we hit them, an additional cantrip for which we choose friends, and a new spell for which we choose Scorching Ray, cause why not? We get back to our misadventuring, and after some wacky hijinks we end up at the House of Grief, which is some weird cultish self-help place. Wanting to be the best version of ourselves that we can be, we break in to search for their top-of-the-line self-help books. Instead of finding books, we find the cult running the place, which as it turns out is a bunch of Shar worshippers who want our artifact. We want the lady in charge's shiny shield, but she seems unwilling to trade, so we get to merc in them instead. Unfortunately, there's a lot of dudes in here who are all decently competent. Some are paladins, some are spellcasters that love casting darkness, which all these enemies can see through, by the way. And to top it off, Viconia, the lady in charge, is stacked with so many buffs. A, a player character amount of buffs, which is just rude. This results in us getting beat up pretty brutally on our first attempt. We do get pretty lucky with some blink procs that we casted from a scroll on our second attempt and managed to get decently far into the fight. But after spending half an hour trying to beat these enemies, we finally fall. And we decide to come back to this one later. Getting back to our search for power, and money to be able to afford Damon's absurd prices, we end up robbing a bank. If anyone asks, this is Damon's fault. I can't believe he charges more just because Soft is ugly. Especially after we saved his life twice. We achieve our strongest power-up as most people do. We go into the sewers where we find some loonies bullying a homeless person, and we show them that hurting people is wrong by killing them. That'll teach them. You heard me right, I said our strongest power-up. Level 11, which gives us more HP, a new spell for which we choose Gust of Wind, and another extra attack, meaning each action is three whole attacks. Watch out, Baldur's Gate. Here we come. With Trident in hand, we return to show Viconia and her villainous vicars what for. 
We're coming in prepared too with an active elixir of bloodlust and blur spell cast on us as we get into position and throw. First turn in initiative goes to the V-Meister herself, who debuffs us to heckin' back, but we're right after, and we throw, and throw, and throw, and get this, we throw, until Vaconia is dead, and her cronies are all damaged up. And then we action surge and do it some more, since in fights like this, it's all about thinning down the enemy's turns as much as possible resulting in just an absurd amount of dead people for what is supposed to be a 6 second turn in IRL time. I wish I could say this fight was challenging, but after increasing our damage output by effectively 50%, this fight becomes a bit of a pushover. The only really annoying part is when an enemy occasionally casts darkness on us, but then on our turn we just walk out of it, so I mean it's really not that bad. We spend the fight hopping around the arena and taking out enemies one by one, and before you know it, this once impossible fight is finished lickety split. For our efforts, we are rewarded with Vaconia's Walking Fortress, a shield that gives plus 3 to our AC, a special damaging reaction when an enemy hits us, advantage on saving throws on all spells, and spell attacks have disadvantage against us. On top of all that, we can also use Reflective Shell as a bonus action once per short rest, which, as the name implies, reflects projectiles at enemies who try and shoot us while it's active, which is only for two turns. It also gives us Warding Bond once per long rest, but that couldn't be more irrelevant. Feeling more powerful than ever before, we head back to the Emperor's hideout to show those Githyanki who's boss. And it's like they know their end is coming. The Portal Wizards don't even bother trying to summon reinforcements. Honestly, this fight is a complete wash, but that just goes to show how powerful we've become over the course of this act. We take them down without any trouble. After dealing with the Gith, we finally acquired enough gold to satisfy Damon's ungrateful yet charming butt, and we purchased the second item we wanted from him, the Armor of Persistence. This armor has 20 base AC, reduces all incoming damage by 2, and gives us both resistance and blade ward. Resistance gives us an extra 1d4 bonus to all our saving throws, while Blade Ward gives us resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage. Well worth the price, and this one will be with us to the end. Having achieved more than a couple game-changing power-ups, we decide to return to the main quest. Throughout our time in Baldur's Gate, we've been finding cultists of Baal murdering people throughout the city, led by Orin. As such, we follow the trail in an attempt to find her and end up at the Murder Tribunal. The Murder Tribunal is composed of a spooky dude named Seravak who is the son of Baal, Lord of Murder, and three spooky ghost ladies too. Not wanting to become an unholy assassin of murder, we decide to fight our way past them to gain entrance to where Orin is hiding. We're heading into this fight a little unprepared, with half our spell slots and no elixir active, but I'm kinda down for the challenge, so we start off. And challenging it is. Saravok himself is a beast with 20s in all his physical stats, and he has 3 cronies that either debuff us or buff him. To make matters worse, should we kill the cronies, Saravok gets a buff based on which one we kill, and should he hit us 4 times, he gains access to a super special move called Deathbringer Assault, which as the name suggests, is no bueno. Our first attempt goes wrong in a number of ways, our hunter's mark gets counterspelled, Instead of taking out the goon that debuffs us, we took out the one that casts Warding Bond and Sanctuary on him. And to make matters worse, as we attempt to kite him, we accidentally trigger all the guards outside who we talked our way past, resulting in us just moving on to the next attempt. Attempt 2, we go in with Blur Active this time, and we're feeling a little bit better, but I make the same mistake of not targeting the person that debuffs us because I'm a silly billy. And we get Command Groveled one too many times, which makes us skip our turn, so we move on to Attempt 3. You know what they say, third time is the charm. We head into combat, still with Blur going, and a few of the enemies get to go first. Saravok misses us, thankfully, and his cheerleaders buff him up with haste, sanctuary, and warding bond before it gets to us. We spend our turn damaging the lady who keeps screwing us over, but are unable to kill her, unfortunately. Still, at least we know you can't make a fool of me three times in a row. We move up the high ground, and on her turn she tries to make us grovel again, but we make the save. The other enemies likewise don't do much on their turns, and when it gets back to us, we shove Seravak off our platform and finish off the mean lady, who when she dies gives Papa Murder a permanent plus 5 to his AC, which is why I wanted to avoid killing her so bad. More turns of the enemies doing next to nothing, with Seravak hitting us just once. 
And on our turn we take out another one of the cronies, which results in the big guy gaining the ability to heal 2d12 on each successful attack. Worth mentioning, all the while we've been sprinkling in some potions of healing to keep our health at tip top. At this point, the last crony has run out of spell slots and is just standing there hurling one-liners at us while we spend our turn standing at the top of this ladder, shoving Mr. Bossman off as soon as he climbs to the top, then pelting him with the Rulnas while he tries to hit us through our blur and shield spell. This goes on for a hot minute, but eventually Saravok falls. Turns out all we needed to do was kill that one lady and the whole fight gets solved. We finish off the Blood Ghost Lady and move on to our next big fight. We track down Orin to the Temple of Baal, and as it turns out, she's kidnapped that child that we enslaved Sori, uh, adopted, for soup-related reasons. She's threatening to kill the kid, but don't worry kid, we'll save you. That... that, that was not my fault. I, uh, I did everything I could have. Uh, sorry, soup kid. Orin gets to beg in her daddy for help, and he turns her into the Slayer, as a fight breaks out and we get to work. Once again, we've got an elixir of heroism, which gives us an extra 1d4 to our attacks and saving throws. And we have at least some more spell slots than the last fight. There's a few cultists here to help Orin, but we're really not concerned about them. Our main concern is the 10 stacks of unstoppable Orin gets each round, with each stack making the next instance of damage she takes get reduced to 1, while also making her immune to being moved against her will. Luckily for us, Narulna takes away two stacks of Unstoppable whenever we throw, so with an action surge we can at least break through the Unstoppable stacks. The enemies begin following us up the stairs, and one of them uses Stunning Gaze on us, which almost gets us, which is very frightening, but we use Indomitable to tough it out. When it gets back to us, we use Hunter's Mark on Orin and start throwing. Then, notice that a large portion of our damage is just ignoring the Unstoppable stacks. I have no idea why, but who am I to question the game's logic? Orin really tries to hurt us, but uh, I'm sure you can see the direction this fight is heading in. On our next turn, we pelt down Orin with the good old Yeetin machine, Hunter's Mark, Action Surge, the whole shebang. And we get her within an inch of her life, so we down a potion of speed to finish her off, which also pisses off the rest of the cultists. Thankfully, the rest of the cultists are absolute pushovers and go down without any real struggle. With that, Orin is dealt with, and we officially have our second Netherstone. I'm sure there was some proper way we were meant to deal with the stacks of Unstoppable, because I could feel the jank emanating from how I did it here, but I honestly have no idea what the intended way of doing this fight is, so if you know, feel free to tell me. Either way, the fight was enough to push us up to our final level up, level 12. With this, we get even more HP, bringing us to 124 as our final amount. We get the chance to swap out spells too, and we decide to swap out Darkness for Fog Cloud, for a strategy you'll see later. And last but not least, we choose our final feat, Alert, which gives us plus 5 to initiative and we can no longer be surprised, since in these final fights to avoid dying we'll need to go as early as possible in the turn order. As we prepare for these most major final showdowns, we head back to the Circus of the Last Days where we commission a statue from this mud mephit and his elemental wife. And sure enough, as we return to camp we find our statue, which horrifyingly enough moves slightly. Regardless, this statue gives us a permanent bless effect for the rest of the game. That translates to a 1d4 bonus to attack rolls and saving throws, which is kinda nutty. Now that we have a new set of boons in hand, we go about collecting our third and final nether stone, alongside Gortash's head. Only problem is we pissed him off, so now whenever we try and enter his fort, everyone inside, including the Steel Watchers, will try and rip us apart. To circumvent this, we down a couple invisibility potions and just quietly creep our way past the legions of Steel Watchers, until we eventually make it to the top of the fortress, where we find Gortash, a couple guards, and a couple Steel Watchers awaiting us. He villain monologues at us and tells us now that we destroyed his underwater slave prison, there's only room in this town for one murderous megalomaniac. Soft, of course, couldn't agree more, and a fight breaks out. I won't get into the specifics of this first attempt too much, because at one point we finished off one of the goons by throwing Nirulna at them, but then Nirulna just didn't come back, and when we checked the floor, it was completely gone too. I genuinely have no idea what happened for certain here, but not wanting to lose our legendary weapon to a bug, we reloaded to restart the fight. Attempt 2 goes the exact same way. I, I didn't realize that this dude devouring magic items was going to be a regular occurrence, but we reload and go for attempt 3. Truly one of the hardest fights in the game. 
Here we are with attempt 3, and this time we get first in initiative too. We start by going straight for the goon that stole Nirulna from us in the first place and damage them quite a fair bit. Most of the enemies spend their turns trying to move closer to us, except this dude, who is just hecka confused for the rest of the fight. And Gortash, who uses a buff on one of the watchers to give it a reflective shield that will send projectiles back at us, should we hit it with one. Back on our turn, we throw the lightning jabber to finish the weapon devouring guy, and thankfully, the jabber survives. It still has an important role to play in the future of this world. We spend the remainder of our turn throwing Nerulna until one of the goons die to collateral damage. Then, we use Reflective Shell, which apparently does not reflect Dazzling Rays. Go figure. And I hope you believe me when I say the hardest part of this fight ended once we got past that guy that kept eating our weapons. The rest of the goons all go down decently easy. And we kinda just ignore the Steel Watchers since they're having an impossible time of hitting us. The difficulty picks up again when Gortash becomes an avatar of tyranny and just starts trying to pummel us to death. Alongside gaining 150 extra temp HP, he also summons a bunch of constructs that grant him an extra 1d4 fire damage for each of them that is active and nearby. We do manage to take out all the nearby ones easily enough, since each of them takes one throw each and they proc our elixir of bloodlust, which gives us the extra action too. On Gortash's turn, he summons a big ol' hand that hovers over the battlefield, but all this hand really does is an AoE attack right over where it's floating, so if we just move out of the way before then, it's nothing to worry about. We bring one of the Steel Watchers down to low HP, which causes it to self-destruct, which is another easily avoidable AoE, and then we start just poking down Gortash, which takes an extra long while since he now has immunity to thunder damage. And yes, don't worry, I finally figured out I can throw the grenades. Thank you for all the comments who told me about that on the last video. After the grenade, we finish off another one of the Steel Watchers with a solid throw, and shortly thereafter very slowly poke down Gortash until he too is dealt with. And the final blow goes to the Lightning Jabber, since the old fellow deserves it. After that, the fight gets wrapped up in a rather explosive way. Soft heads over to Yoink the Last Netherstone and learns the location of the Netherbrain. So close to finally being alone. But before Soft can be liberated, we've got a couple more things to do. First up on that list is returning to the House of Grief, since we want to see Soft achieve her peak before this run is over with. We head to the altar where we slaughtered Viconia and her cronies and make a hefty donation. A thousand gold pieces to be more precise. And that gives us access to a chamber with the Mirror of Loss inside. We approach the mirror and to get the full benefit from it first, we need to make a couple high DC int checks. And with an inordinate amount of quick loading, we are able to. Afterwards, we are able to use the mirror to sacrifice some of our more academic memories, which results in a minus two to our intelligence, and in return we get to gain someone else's memories, for which we choose a general's memories, which gives us a permanent plus two to our strength. We also take a long rest afterwards to get rid of the minus two to int. Next up on the list is just an average Tuesday for Soft. We're breaking into hell to rob from the devil. This starts with us heading to the Devil's Fee, where after breaking into her bedroom, reading her diary, then passing a difficult persuasion check, the shopkeep gives us all we need to create a portal to Raphael's House of Hope. Upon arriving in the house, we are greeted by Hope, who would have thought? Who, as it turns out, is being imprisoned and tortured by Raphael. She gives us a disguise and asks us to rescue her, seeing as how she knows her way around, we agree. While we're exploring the place, we stumble upon the Archive, which has all sorts of insane items in it. We try to use the old hide in a fog cloud and steal the item trick, but it doesn't seem to fool them, unfortunately. It does, however, turn the whole house hostile, which makes things a bit trickier for exploring, but is probably for the best in the long run. We also take a closer look at one of the items here, the Orphic Hammer, which can break any form of imprisonment and could even be used to free hope. Or perhaps even Orpheus. Wink wink. To no one's surprise, our controlling cranial companion doesn't much like this. After slaughtering our way through most of the house, we find another power-up in the form of the Hell Dusk Helmet, which gives us immunity to being blinded, lets us see through all kinds of darkness up to 12 meters around us, makes us immune to crits, gives us a plus two to our saving throws against spells, and gives us the immolating gaze feature, which we will never use. We return to grab the Orphic Hammer after having found the magic password in Raphael's bedroom and head off in search of hope. We find her being imprisoned underneath Raphael's estate, and there's a whole bunch of imps and spectators guarding her, but with a couple good whacks, she's set free. Don't worry, Hope. Soft is here to save the day. And she just teleported through the floor and died. 
No, really, take a close look. Whatever, who needs hope anyways? Let's go beat up Raphael. As we go to wash our hands of this place, Raphael shows up to remind us that our graphic settings actually aren't that bad. And while he's at it, he gives us a sick speech while conjuring up some reinforcements to destroy us. And with that, it's big boss fight time. That's right gang, it's Soft versus Raphael, Yurgir, some other random lady, and a whole host of devils, and boy is this a tough one. Raphael's got a lot going on, but the basic gist is he's got these four pillars that empower him to an insane degree while they're active, giving him 1d12 extra fire damage for each one, and each turn he heals from them too. To make matters worse, his fire damage ignores our resistance, and on top of all that, he's got a special resource that lets him unleash insanely powerful attacks and... Hey, Raphael, buddy, I'm trying to make a video here. Alright, whatever, man. It's your video. For now, down here come the claws. the first two attempts, but third time is the charm as they say. Our third attempt starts out and we manage to take out one of the pillars early on, and we cast Blink on ourselves to avoid as much of Raphael's damaging attacks as possible. To be extra safe, we also use Reflective Shell. This pays off when Raphael bounces his diabolic chains back onto himself and we live another day. The next turn we take out another one of the pillars and we're off to the races. Feeling the momentum, we decide it's time to take risks, so we down a speed potion to take another one out and soften up the last one. We manage to survive another turn since Raphael spends his turn transforming back into his weaker form, and when it comes back to us we take out the final pillar. Now we've just got to deal with, you know, the actual enemies. To deal with them we start by misty stepping away using a scroll, then poking them from afar while they're all bunched up. With our third action we cast protection from evil and good and start running deeper into the house, which is clear of enemies since we got rid of them all beforehand. To make things extra safe, our blink procs this turn too. Knowing we've got to play this turn extra smart since our speed potion is about to run out, we use two of our actions to poke down the enemies as much as possible, and our remaining one to dash miles away so the enemies have to spend their next couple turns running to... We just diagroed all of them. And they're healing themselves too, great. I had no idea that could happen, but in the spirit of the run, I decided not to quick save even though technically we're out of combat. Thankfully, Raphael didn't fully heal himself, so we just call it a minor hiccup and head back into the fight. Not all of the enemies aggro at first, so we do our best to position ourselves to get their attention without just getting ourselves killed while still taking out the goons. They spend their turns trying to catch us, but we finish off the last fiendish fella on our turn, and now it's just us and Rafi left. And while he is still a big concern, he isn't once we learn a couple things about him. Number one, he's way less threatening when he's in melee. And number two, we can throw him. That second one isn't a tactical boost, but more of a morale one. Upon learning these facts, it isn't long before Raphael's dramatic butt is down for the count. And now we've got one last thing left to do. Oh, holy crap, your gear's still here with another goon. Well, not for long. And now we have one last thing left to do. We track down the nether brain to a morphic pool under the city, and it reveals to us that this was its plan all along, because we're not tentacled enough to control it. We give it a go anyways, but as it turns out, we're indeed not tentacled enough. So will you regroup with the most tentacled man we know? 
He tells us the best way to proceed is to use the tadpole to transform into a mind flayer, but we tell him he's a creepy loser and he just dips and joins his sworn enemy who he's been trying to escape for decades. Sure, why not, man? Soft sets Orpheus free using the Orphic Hammer and we catch him up to date. He decides to undergo the Mind Flayer transformation, which means we've got to get him to the Nether Brain. Unfortunately, to get to the Brain, we first got to fight through a small army's worth of enemies. This took us a long time, but honestly wasn't that much of a problem. We didn't even use a single spell slot. Seeing us shred through their battalion out front, they start sending full-on spaceship bombardments after us while drop troopers fly in from above, but we race past them to reach the Nether Brain. Upon reaching the Nether Brain, we're greeted by a dominated red dragon, four regular mind flayers, and worst of all, the Emperor. Also, this lady, who I totally forgot was my dream visitor, and I was very confused when she showed up with some gravitas to her reveal, like I was supposed to recognize her. As the fight starts, our goal is to get Orpheus to the ground at the other side of the battlefield, and get him to channel the Nether Stones for a turn, which means keeping him alive during that time. And for an added bit of pressure, we have a few turns till a nautiloid arrives with reinforcements. We make our way onto the nether brain and some tentacles start popping up to slow us down, but we largely ignore them, alongside the dragon, only killing the tentacles to give us extra actions with our bloodlust potion. On Orvius's turn, he uses a mind blast to finish off the dream visitor while stunning the emperor and the dragon, before he gets unfortunately caught by a tentacle. The emperor gets caught on our turn and it is with a hefty good riddance that we see him go before we free Orpheus from the tentacle with another throw. We also action surge to finish off the tentacle and heal up the Gith Prince with some potions. He manages to take out one of the other Mind Flayers on his turn and begins to clear the path to the ground. He does get quite damaged from some magic missiles, but he'll be fine. The dragon, no longer stunned, uses its fire breath on soft, but thanks to her fire resistance, we're not stressed at all. On our turn, we clear the way by finishing off the last illithid in Orpheus' way and cast Fog Cloud, hoping Orpheus can hide in it while he channels the stones. We learn that he can't channel the nether stones while in the Fog Cloud, unfortunately, but we do use his turn to stun one of the baddies before he gets channeling. The enemies do their best to stop him before the channeling is completed, but it's too little and too late. The channeling is completed and a portal into the Netherbrain's psyche is formed. One last battle till Soft is at last alone. This part of the fight has a couple gimmicks that are quite annoying for us to deal with. The first is this arena is made up of platforms that we have to hop between and they get progressively destroyed by these giant balls of energy, which will also one-shot us if we're on the platform at the time. The next gimmick is the Netherbrain's psionic retribution whenever we damage it that deals a ridiculous amount of psychic damage and worst of all gives us the mind broken condition, which limits us to one attack per action unless we succeed a ridiculously high DC intelligence saving throw. And last but not least, we actually only have a few turns to finish off the nether brain which has 450 HP, otherwise we instantly lose. Basically this fight is one massive damage test and in my opinion not an extremely interesting one. It is also a damage test that we fail by quite a large margin on our first attempt. I was crushed when this happened because I thought this might be where it ends. We go on to attempt 2, having to fight our way past all the goons that were protecting the Nether Brain's crown once again and make it back into the psyche. Where we once again fail the damage test, but this time by a matter of 9 HP. Now we know it's possible and we come back with a vengeance on attempt 3. Early on in attempt 3 we throw Nirulna and she just never comes back. Lost to the abyss beneath the nether brain. A tragic loss but she'd want us to continue so we pull out the lightning jabber for the rest of the fight and pray the old fellow won't get taken too. Next up is Orpheus using fierce perilous strikes on soft to grant us 15 bonus psychic damage plus 2d8 healing on each attack and we score a critical hit on 15 or higher. But on the downside we become vulnerable to all damage sources for the duration. A risky play, but risk is what we need. We then transform Orpheus into a Displacer Beast and tell him to go wild. With Fierce Perilous Strikes active on Soft, she jabs, and jabs, and jabs, and jabs. And with that, the Nether Brain is vanquished, and begs us to spare it, but... What the heck, Orpheus? What are, what are you doing, man? <laughs> you don't need to be a Displacer Beast anymore. Okay, whatever, moving on. We refuse the Nether Brain's request for salvation, instead choosing to vanquish it, which at last gives Soft the peace she was looking for, and causes the brain to crash onto the land below. But don't worry, I get the feeling it'll be a soft landing. 
We also get an incredibly touching moment with Orpheus during the aftermath. I just, I mean, you gotta love the cinematic camera work. And with that, the day is saved. Soft at last is well and truly alone. Baldur's Gate is saved more as a side effect than anything else, and Soft wanders into the sunset, never to be seen again. So it turns out you can beat Act 3 on Tactician with just a lone wolf fighter. And what a fighter she was. We'll miss you always, Soft. And thank you all for watching. I really appreciate it. The support has been insane, and I can't wait to make more videos like this. If you guys want to vote on what class I play through the game with next as a lone wolf, vote on the poll on my channel. It should be active as soon as this video is out. Thank you all again, and have a good day.